Welcome to another Wargame Review with theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. And I'm Alexander. Today, as we continue our Wargame uh, marathon, I guess, over a couple of days, we are playing, for the first time today, a design from Brian Train entitled Tiny Battle Publishing called Winter Thunder. This is a game that focuses on the Battle of the Bulge, as we all know, historically occurred in mid-December 1944 and lasted to the very first of January. And it was the uh, Wehrmacht's very final kind of death throw uh, trying to make something happen that would stop the Allied advance. So this game, it is a hex encounter game. It does have a very interesting, it uses a couple of different mechanics. It uses a blind chip pull where you're drawing from a cup or whatever Brian Train described that as is a hilarious. It was a, it was a randomizer. A randomizer. They have a fancy name for it. Right. Um, you're drawing your unit activation chits from that cup or randomizer, and then you're activating those units. So you're never quite sure when you're going to go. I think at the very beginning, the uh, Germans have like 10 counters in it's that cup. Lot, yeah. And I think the Americans have two. So the Americans, the first round, really the first and second round, do a lot of sitting, waiting for their opportunity to move their units. Interestingly enough, I felt like I drew my activation shit very early on, or one of my two, and used it to my advantage to do some prepared positions, which was interesting. But it uses that, that blind chip pull system to activate units. You then in a command radius or range, are able to activate a certain amount of units, I think no more than six, correct? Six divisions. Six yeah. divisions. You move those around, trying to, as the Germans, push the Americans back. As the Americans, the goal is to tactically retreat while doing damage to the Germans as their re reinforcements are not as heavy as the Americans. Um, so it also uses a very... Very interesting double blind matrix for determining the type of attack that is being used. Yeah, and that's that's easily one of my favorite parts about this game. And it actually has a very Euro game type of feel to it. Yes, it does. It reminds me too, it's like action selection in some ways. Yeah, but doing it blindly, there's a lot of games that do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, th th and you're doing more. it doubly blindly. You're both. Yeah. You're not drawing and reacting to whatever the first pro player. You're you're guessing. Yeah. And there's a matrix that tells you what type of outcomes are going to happen. Very interesting. And the matrix is is kind of something that you will be studying during this game. Right. But Trying to figure out how to how to manipulate it to your advantage. I'm not sure sure I did by the end of the game, but I was figuring out some of the items. I was like, yeah, I'd want to do this so that I don't get killed and I can retreat, or I want to force wounds on him, so I'm going to make sure I do this. Yeah, and that's that's it's really cool, because the attacker has four options, one of which can only be used, a, it's called a blitz, if you have armor. So if you don't have armored units, you've got three different types of attacks that you can do. Kind of a general balance attack, a full frontal assault, or kind of a Infiltration, Sneaky, infiltrate, yeah. kind of flanking type thing. But the defender has six kind of defensive postures to take. You know, one of which is like a counterattack. Some of them are just kind of normal defense. Some of them are defending a lot. Some of them are just running away. Withdraw. Yeah. And so you, you choose these secretly. You reveal them. And you just cross on the matrix. And that the matrix then tells you things like um, your casualty modifiers. So it might you might take significantly more wounds if you do a frontal assault, especially if they're defending well. Mm -hmm. But if you do a frontal assault and the other person runs away, well, you just you just walk into their base because they left. Right. So there's, there's really interesting stuff that goes on with, with this. Um, you know, you move your very traditional hex encounter style game, but then you have the this combat matrix makes gives you... I don't know, it's almost this mini bluffing game kind of thing. Yeah, like, it is. What am I going to yeah. do? Or you're looking at what results are okay, which results can I not afford to do? Right. Which results can I actually absorb? Yeah. And once again, as the Americans, because I played the Americans, I kept asking myself, 
I wanted to do some damage, particularly to your Panzer units. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I could sacrifice some of my smaller brigades um, that that didn't really matter because they only they were only one power or two power. How could I do the right attack to make sure I'm doing at least one reduction? And if I get lucky, maybe two, depending on rolls. So I, I thought that was absolutely very very fascinating. Yeah. Outside of that, you've got a very um, this. So the scale of this game is a little bit higher up than most bulge games. Most bulge games, you'll get uh, it is company and brigade based. This is typic, mostly divisional. Yeah, it is how it is, and you have a um, core HQs and army HQs. So there's a lot of supply based stuff. Very typical of a bulge game in that way, but it's the map is. Fairly small, but but there's uh, there's still a lot to do. It just because the map's small doesn't mean it's a short game necessarily. No, we we actually played probably four and a half hours and only got about halfway done. But yeah, we could have played mainly one and a half. once again. We're learning the rules and trying to figure it out and talk through it. But the other interesting thing about the scale, your only units that really count in the end are your divisional units. Yeah, those are, those are the key units. Yeah, those are the ones that when you lose, that is a victory point for your enemy. So as, as you can see, if you can kind of see here, my Americans had, looks like, eight total casualties amongst uh, their, their smaller units, brigades. Um, they, they didn't matter because those aren't going to score you, yeah. score you victory points. Now, they mattered only because that helped me stave off... Uh, attacks and, and, and hold ground. I ended up losing three units that gave me three points. I killed one uh, German division, which gave me a point. But the game really is about jockeying, particularly for the German, jockeying position to find the weak spot, to exploit, to run through, and then begin taking over some of these town and city hexes that in the end will score a lot, of a lot of victory points. I think the city hexes were three. 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 So if you could ever get Sedan, for example, that that's big. But it's but doing that then is going to be hard. Like every bulge game, you got to get there and keep yourself in supply. That's right. that's the hardest part of these. Yeah. Is you're getting attacked on all sides. You know, you try to stave off everything, keep you guys in supply, so you can score those victory points. Um. So what were some other things that you liked? What was some, other than the mission matrix Which and the double blind? Good. I, and I do really like that. Right. What was something else you enjoyed about the design? Well, I, okay, so what I liked about this, so it's chip pull and you have your HQs. What I enjoyed is that the HQs are uh, more generic, so to speak, in, uh, than in other games. They're not necessarily tied specifically to yeah. companies or... Or divisions. There's you can a, activate any units that are within range. That are within... So there's a couple of parameters. Mm -hmm. So the SS units, uh, these little purple units... So Kind of cool, by the way. I yeah, like that they were purple. Those can only be activated by purple HQs, but the entire rest of the German army okay. are all... It's, it's, it's Wehrmacht, so they're all this kind of gray-green, olive color. Mm -hmm. And so each, each of those HQs, and the Germans have like eight of those color can activate any of the units of the same color. And, and it just gives you that broad scope to it. Yeah, up to a maximum of six. So, yeah, so a lot so of... So you can never create some huge counteroffensive with one headquarters with 12 units. Yeah. And I, I like that, that it limited that, because yeah, I thought that's... that made that more realistic. Imagine having to convey orders to four or five different groups, and this time it would have been very difficult. And, th and that, that's to do with the scale, right? You have yeah. core headquarters, you can move a few kind of divisions around and I'm just I mean we played a lot of games with chip draw and you pull the one and it's got the green stripe on it so you can only activate the three, three green units. stripes and yeah if one of them's out of supply you're boned yeah this gave you a bit more flexibility with that but it was still extremely important to have your leaders well distributed mm -hmm. and as you stretch out over the map you start to get thinner and thinner and further and further away from your leaders and your HQ so there's a lot of really cool stuff going I, I think there. the management of that aspect was kind of cool, especially for me as the Americans. I think I started with two, and we played a shortened scenario, which we'll talk a little bit about that. We're, we're still a little confused with 
while it shortened the game because there were less activation potentials, yeah, was, I would have preferred that the game was shortened by eliminating a day. But that's my opinion. Well, it did. It eliminates four days worth, but so the game is going to be way shorter. But the, that they they took you remove certain units, and, and it just so made game, it such that it was imbalanced. I thought, as far as imbalanced, yeah. as far as who can act and when, you had ten chits to my two. I would have had three that first round, a little bit better. I would have had five the second round. All of a sudden, it starts getting a little closer. And it basically cuts off the whole southern flank. Right. Which is a very different... And it actually made it, as you were, yeah, if you could see the map, you're really right. kind of sweeping around. It's very and different. it's going to be very hard for me to prevent you from yeah. getting these three-point cities. But it, it, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit more. Um, but the management of those counters, I thought was very cool. Those HQ counters, I had to try to keep asking myself, "What's my control span or my command span? How can I make sure I'm activating all units along the front?" And it it required me to work a little bit harder than it did to you. Your problem and your challenge was a little different. You had so many headquarters that you had to make sure those headquarters could be used to do something. Meaningful. Well, and then and then after the first few turns, the Germans start to roll a die, and some of them are out of half supply. of those. So I roll a seven, half rounded it up. So four, four. of my core headquarters, I just got to choose them to be out of supply, like for that turn, which so, means they can't really do much yeah, at all. Yeah, it abstracts part of the problem that the Germans faced in this. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. not a ton of logistics to worry about in that sense, but it, sometimes it just hamstrings you. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So then you really, really have to... Be, so you've only got two core HQs because four of them are knocked out, basically. And trying to keep everyone else in supply, as a result, means you have to be really careful about where you're putting your your leaders in that right. way. Right, right. So, so I also... A couple of elements that I liked, there were two kind of... What I would consider chrome. There are additional rules that kind of spice it up. Uh, I liked the, the blocking uh, mechanism... So in essence, what the Americans, or I guess the, the Germans could do it, right? But no. You couldn't do it. So the Americans, it was, it was understood that we had uh, engineer units in, in certain divisions and formations and would be able to, in, a, in essence, establish roadblocks that would slow down or act as speed bumps for the Germans. I strategically placed them a couple of times as I was having to tactically retreat and relocate my control and to delay Alexander a whole turn so I could get some more units down to stop him, I had to use those roadblocks. Yeah, because otherwise it, I could strategically yeah, move boom, 12 right spots through. With, with some guys. So that was, I, I liked that element because it, once again, it added another element that I had to think about, focus on, and gave me another tool to kind of combat the disadvantage, the inherent disadvantage in a surprise counterattack in the middle of winter um, where the Americans were really caught down, uh, caught, caught with their, their pants down. So really liked that blocking element. I think I used those three times, maybe four times. And I thought effectively they, they did what I needed them to do. Yeah. The other element that we didn't necessarily use because there never really was an opportunity to use it was the exploitation. Alexander, do you want to talk about the exploitation? Yeah, so like most games, you do all your moves, and then you do all your combats. Unless you mark your units for exploit, which you do all your moves, you do all your combats, and then units marked for exploit then do their moves and combats. So what, what that, it's really cool, you have to, you're gambling, I suppose, yeah. on the outcomes of these combats. You're gambling that the attack you're doing now will go the way you need it to go yeah. to take advantage of your exploit marker. So, because, you know... Which is cool. I'll do, we'll do a combat and... You know, I'll force you to retreat, or I'll kill you outright. Opens up a that's, yeah. it opens up a gap. You know, then my guy who's marked for exploit can run all the way through that gap because they're not really zones of control. No, this is not necessarily a very sticky game. You can run quite freely across the board, and and you can just you can run through. You can cut people off, attack from the rear because then there's value in doing that kind of yeah. stuff. There's, there's uh, flanking and. Um, and, and I think, unfortunately, we didn't really necessarily get to that real point where that was going to become regularly doable. No, and that's because I shredded you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, crushed, you crushed my guys at the beginning. <laughs> there and there wasn't necessarily a lot of need to use right. that as much. But having it there 
is a really cool way to just, I don't know. I, I really liked having those there as yeah. like a blanket to be able to do that kind yep. of thing. Well, that was really cool. Well, it was another option, kind of like the block, uh, the block markers. It's another option to effectuate the, the uh, mission that you're trying yeah. to go for. Just gave you another tool. So really, uh, there are some neat elements that I think I really liked and I would like to explore more. Uh, so those were two things that I really liked. Um, I always like in war games when they add what I call Chrome, and I think everybody calls Chrome, just those little elements that kind of make the game stand out from other designs. So let's face it, how many how many bold games are there? There's, uh, There's dozens, but, right? That's Some like are the, better than others. The two most gamed things is East Front, Bob and, and, and the Bulge. The Bulge. So each design needs to try and work very hard to add a little extra element that is, is neat or innovative. And I think Brian did a good job with that exploitation element, the blocking... Uh, there also was some improved position uh, options, which I used quite, I thought, effectively at the beginning, and it slowed you down. And, I'll, and I will keep coming back to this. This matrix, the mission matrix, is a fantastic yeah. piece of game design. It is. It is really fun. Yeah. And that's the most important part for a game. It has to be fun. Yep. And yep. this, it, 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 I, I really, really enjoyed that. There's just yeah. some neat parts of this game, but this really made it stand out from other kind of other bulge games to be. Yeah, yeah. So, so finally to wrap up, I think what we wanted to talk a little bit about was there are a couple of topics that are that are heavily gamed in war gaming. Those two are Eastern Front games and Battle of the Bulge games. And to be honest, we we talk about this often in Eastern Front games. If you're the Russians, first ten turns you're getting your nose bloody. You're getting punched in the mouth. You're getting you have to retreat, and, and you don't really get a lot of opportunity to do much. Also in the bulge, same thing. First couple of rounds until the weather clears and you start using some of your aircraft power, some other things, and you get some reinforcements, it's hard to do much. This game, I thought, was very, very like that. And we played... It's just not fun to beat someone else back and really allow them not to do... Yeah, anything. when I'm taking four times as many turns as you, I know that's not fun for you, and that's also not necessarily as fun for me as well. Right. But, so, what I enjoy about this, in that sense, is it's chip draw, um, you can fiddle around with the mission matrix, excellent solo game. Right, it would make a solo potential There's a ton of, pretty well. A ton of East Front games, a game like this, um, I know France 1944 is one that uses chip pull that's very much the same, you know, it's just Crush crusade against yeah. across Europe that's the title of the game and I, I'm going to play those solo because I wouldn't want to sit through as the Germans getting smashed right. a, a, across the entire of Northern Europe for three hours it's not fun to do and you know there's there's some gaming kind of philosophy there of, mm -hmm. well am I playing it for the historical aspect am I am I, right. am I taking pride in having a good valiant Defense. fighting retreat yeah but ultimately, and, and, and I mentioned that, if I'm going to sit here for four hours, I don't want to get I don't want to get right, way bomb um, for four hours yeah. necessarily. And I did mention to you there are a couple moments where you make a good move, you either tactically retreat and then follow that up with a, a nice attack, and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I won. Yeah, I'll get the good counter attack. I, yeah, come I did something and great, and that was kind of that satisfaction for that for that couple of rounds. Overall, though, I, I just, a, a word of warning, a game like this, a game like any East Front game, I remember a couple Thanksgivings ago, we played Case Blue, yeah, which was... From, unconditional Surrender Case Blue. Yeah, Unconditional, Blue. right, right, sorry. <laughs> unconditional Surrender Case Blue scenario from C3I Magazine. I was the Russians, you were the Germans, and it was, same thing, round after round after round, I'm getting beat up. I, I actually had a really couple cool moments in that one, and I felt fulfilled, after we finished that. This, I, I had yet to have my real good moment. And I I have a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. But it doesn't mean I wouldn't want to try this solo. Yeah, that's how To I get a better that. understanding of the game. And also to, to experience a little better. So I would warn you. If you're going to look at picking up Winter Thunder. From Little Tiny Battle Publishing. Sorry, I got the name wrong twice now. You're going to want to understand that. Americans, you're going to get beat up. Germans, you're going to, for the first six rounds, you're going to be riding high. And doing everything. And doing everything. Yeah. Taking all the turns. You just need to understand that. If that's your bag, 
you're gonna be okay. And that's just it. That's nothing to do with this game. It's just to do it's with the, the bulge. Yeah. Right. It's the campaign that it's focused this on. This does that really well. Yep. And, and and as much as I think playing this on tail would be really cool to avoid kind of getting smashed on, you would lose the the real depth from the mission matrix. They gave a I was reading in the rules just while we're talking about that. They did give a, a way to yeah. kind of randomize it, but I, I, I'd need to read this whole thing and better understand it. But there's nothing nothing quite like meta gaming oh, doing right. this with another person. Yeah, this, it was very the mission cool. matrix is really fun. We I, enjoy Alexander and I both enjoy any game that you're gaming each other. Bluffing games, uh, auctioning games are always our yeah. trick. Anything you're lying about. <laughs> you know, one of the games that we play often is a Euro card game called Sheriff of Nottingham, and you're lying the entire time trying to get one over on your... And, and we enjoy that, and I think this is our favorite element of this game, hands down. Yeah. So so some final thoughts, Alexander. Uh, t- verdict on this game, and, and... how This is a very cost-effective game. Oh, yeah, this was... Twenty twenty dollars twenty yeah. So from that sense, if you want a bulge game for that price, yep. this is a really good one. I would recommend it if only for this. Yeah, I would recommend it. But it's got all the other you know great bulge game stuff in there. Right. They took away a lot of the fiddliness of some of some some of the aspects. You know, it's my combat value. There's some you know terrain modifiers. You roll hits Fairly based simple. on the types of units you have in mm-hmm. combat. So. For each division in a combat, the enemy is going to roll X amount of casualties. Yep. So there's some really cool parts there, but you know it doesn't get too bogged down in worrying about calculations and odds. Yeah, and yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not bad. Having it this high level means there's less on the board than in some bulge games, so that's nice too. But yeah. for twenty five, even thirty bucks, this is a steal. Yeah, I, I also enjoyed it. I say enjoy it. It's one of those... Enjo- I say enjoy it, but it was like putting salt in a wound. I was getting beat up, <laughs> and it was like every time, every turn, you'd draw a new chit, and I'd be like, oh, great. Here, here it comes again. And I had to brace myself. I will say, I finally got my more significant reinforcements, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne, and a couple of... I think I got a tank division and a, and a new command uh, counter... So I was going to be able to, to now start launching some some counteroffensives to stem the tide, but if you look at the map, I was still kind of in the center, and I was at least a turn, if not two, away from really beginning able being able to do that. So I, I liked it affordably. It's a way to get into a bulge game, learn it, and this tactical matrix is great. I enjoyed that. So nice job, Brian, on that. Um, but that that's our thoughts. If you're interested in this, uh, check out the video. this video. If you liked it, go ahead and, and like and subscribe to the channel. We will be doing a, a review over the next couple of weeks on this, giving you a better look into our thoughts about some of the mechanics. So thanks a lot. This has been theplayersaid.com.